Hi, I'm John Cerruto, and welcome to part two with this special hometown special with Jeff Belenfonte, executive producer, 45 years in the television industry. And you know, Jeff, part one was so interesting to touch upon so many wonderful things that you've done in in the industry. Of course, especially with sports and baseball, and it's interesting because as you had discussed, you had an interest in baseball, but you didn't have a passion, but it certainly seems that that passion has been ignited as the years have gone on. And you're very proud and you're very interested in the history and keeping the history of baseball, aren't you? Well, since I was a government and politics major and interested in the history of our country, I was fascinated because one of the things that we inherited when we became Major League Baseball Productions uh, was the baseball library. And we actually had footage back to 1904. We could identify uh, the, uh, the teams on the field uh, in uh, the opening day for the 1904 uh, season because they were the w winning teams from the 1903 World Series, which I think was the Pirates, actually. But I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but we knew, we knew that that's where that uh, footage had come from. And we may have had older footage, but we could identify that. And we had all of the World Series films uh, that had been done through the years by various people, uh, kind of light in the 20s and 30s, but uh, pretty consistent from 1942 on uh, with World Series films. And we were able to uh, use that library to become the basis of a number of our productions. And it was nice to have access to that and the stock footage that that provided as B-roll for the stories that we could tell. Why do you think baseball has kept its popularity going way back to its inception and of course during the 20s with Babe Ruth and you know the different stars as we've gone forth and there's been so many changes in mm -hmm. our world in our country but the one thing that persists seems to be our national pastime. Yeah, I, I, I you know clearly there are uh, you know there the, the popularity of baseball has been eroded by football in recent years. And that isn't to say that baseball isn't still popular with a number of people. I think that part of it has to do with the strategy involved in the game. Part of it has to do with the accessibility of the game. Part of it has to do with the fact that, you know, you don't put your life in danger every time you get on the field. That isn't to say that there isn't some danger, but um, nevertheless, it's not uh, as violent as, as, as football. And I think that you, if you have the hand-eye coordination and the skills to play baseball, which we all do at some point along the way in Little League, we can identify with the greatness of the athletes on the field. And at the same time, because of the, the, the sport and the, the way it's played, the structure of the sport, we can identify with the foibles of the players on the field, the bloopers, the missed balls, the, you know, uh, balls hitting people on the head and going over the, uh, the fence, which we talked about in the past. Um, I think that people can, uh, re can, can identify with uh, the, the, the realities of playing sports and that, uh, that baseball becomes a little more accessible than football uh, to the average guy. Well, one thing that I found fascinating is that you actually had something to do with bringing the fan a little closer to the game. And of course, that's doing something that hadn't been done before, and that's wearing what we're wearing. Oh, yeah, wireless microphones, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of my life was to get the, uh, the Lords of Baseball uh, to allow us to mic uh, players in the world, uh, or managers in the World Series. When did that first happen? Well, we did it in 1975 uh, with, with uh, some um, kicking and streaming by the, uh, by the Lords of Baseball, but we were able to do it and we were able to bring people an insight into the game that they hadn't seen before. Um, and uh, that was, it was one of the most exciting things that we did bring to the game. The other thing that I, I was kind of proud of, uh, particularly in the, in the 75 World Series, is that um, one of the things that I got uh, uh, tasked with in that World Series, and I was a, a junior producer at the time, was I had uh, what was then called a, a, a Filmo. It's a small 16 millimeter wind up camera. It didn't have a battery. And I was able to ro roam the stands looking for interesting cutaways that we could use in the film. And in one of the games that uh, uh, Louis Tiant pitched, I stumbled upon a gentleman in the stands who seemed to be involved in every single pitch. 
I later find out that the gentleman is Louis Tian's father, who had come up from Cuba on a special visa to see his son pitch in the World Series. So, of course, we use that as part of the story in the, in the, in the film that we made. And that's the kind of thing that we like to do. We like to find uh, interesting stories that we could intercut with the game action on the field in the World Series films. And we continue to do that throughout our, our, um, uh, our years of producing that World Series film. It was always something that we thought, while it documented the games, it also brought stories to life that, you know, so I always thought of them, interestingly enough, not as World Series films, but as mini documentaries on each film. And we shot, we actually shot film until 1980. 1980 was the last 16 millimeter World Series, hmm. which was great fun uh, as a filmmaker, as a film student. And I, uh, I journeyed up to uh, Eastman Kodak at that point in Rochester, and I said, you know, there's this stuff out there called videotape. And unless you subsidize the World Series films, they're all going to end up going to tape sooner or later. And don't you think that's exactly what happened? Eastman Kodak didn't step up, and of course, you know, video st started taking over. And in 1981, uh, we actually did the World Series on videotape for the first time. So innovation and technology passed Eastman Kodak by, and, well, and the rest is history. Yeah, unfortunately, absolutely. unfortunately, but we we gave them the, the opportunity. The only ones who, of course, were true to the Eastman Kodak film tradition were the uh, NFL folks who, who, who uh, uh, ended up shooting uh, film up until, I think, last year. Did you have, aside from the 75 World Series, did you have a World Series that you thought was dramatic, that was absolutely special to cover? I, I, I think one of the most underrated World Series was the 1991 World Series between the Twins and the Braves. Um, I thought it was, it was a very exciting World Series. Um, with lots of in seven lots games, of seven game World Series, and it was very exciting. It was very exciting to cover, but I, I will tell you that through the years we got to do all sorts of weird stuff. In 1997, we went from Miami Heat to a snowstorm in Cleveland. In fact, there's a shot of me shooting in the stands in the World Series film in 1987 in the middle of what looked like a blizzard. So you know we've experienced it all. We've experienced it all. Well, you and I also have talked previously about your feelings about baseball and its association with the country and uh, maybe the evolution of our country socially. I, I think so. I think it has played a very important part. I mean, you, uh, you don't have to go back to beyond 1947 with Jackie Robinson to go to, to, to see the importance of uh, baseball in, in, in the history of America. But I think it goes even further than that. And, and again, I'm not speaking about anything that hasn't been well documented and well written, but I think that a lot of the immigrant communities, uh, particularly in New York, but not necessarily only in New York, found their way into American culture by studying baseball and, stu and, 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 and playing baseball. And, uh, you know, you have uh, people like Hank Greenberg and, and others who come up from those uh, immigrant col uh, uh, cultures and uh, 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 Italian Hill in... Um, Joe DiMaggio, in, Joe, uh, Joe Graziola. Joe, well, Graziola and, and Yogi Berra, the two I'm thinking, both of whom came out of the uh, immigrant community, uh, Italian immigrant community in St. Louis, uh, DiMaggio out of, on the West Coast. But I, I think that um, it was... Uh, as boxing is for some, uh, uh, a way out of that, of that life. And, and those people have become um, uh, certainly role models for lots of people back then. Um, and it, it's not unlike what's happened uh, today, but uh, it, it, it's different. But I think that that has a, a great deal to do with the history and the development of, uh, uh, of, our, of our country and the way the immigrant communities have been assimilated. And I think a lot of it has to do with baseball. And of course, you said you saw that, of course, but doing your special on Jackie Robinson. I did, yes. The African-American coming into the and baseball. And the Negro Major Leagues, leagues. Yep. And, 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 and the, the uh, number of great players that were in the Negro Leagues that weren't ever allowed to play in Major League Baseball and how um, you know Jackie paved the way for you know lots of great 
uh, African American ball players. When no you did the that. documentary, did you deal with his wife? Yes, we did with Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have over the years, and I worked with his daughter Sharon at Major League Baseball. She was involved in uh, working on an educational program for baseball. I got to work with her pretty closely. Um, great people. Uh, Rachel is a terrific person. They run the Jackie Robinson Foundation uh, to this day. Now you're involved with also the baseball assistance team. I was. Tell yes, us about mm -hmm. the baseball assistance team. What was your role? Well. There were a lot of other people, in fact, Joe, Joe Garagiola uh, uh, among, among them, uh, who felt that um, there were a lot of people in the baseball community uh, that needed help and assistance that, um, you know, weren't the headline makers. I mean, baseball is an industry. Um, you know, we used to, we used to have these uh, industry meetings uh, in November after the se season, and, you know, Hundreds of people would descend upon uh, Scottsdale, Arizona for these things, and all of a sudden you looked around and you realized, boy, this isn't just a sport, it's a, it's a business. And all of those people, or uh, many of those people, are not paid what the ball players are paid. And they have the same problems that we all do. Health issues, drug issues, et cetera, et cetera. And um, Joe was very, very active in forming uh, what was the first league-sponsored support uh, charity for the baseball family. Um, they, to this day, have offices at Major League Baseball, uh, but they have great cooperation from the Players Association. And they try, uh, they raise money, and they take that money uh, and give grants back to members of the baseball community who need the money for health, to fight cancer, whatever. Guys who were minor, career minor leaguers, who are struggling to make a living, even some major leaguers, some of whom may be down on their luck or came up for a cup of coffee, uh, and then, you know, find themselves with a health problem or a family issue or something. And BAT gets together and uh, makes donations to those players to help them out. And I, I always felt it was a very important organization. Um, uh, another gentleman who used to work with us, Mike Costell, was very involved with BAT in the, uh, in the early years. We used to run a, a, a dinner in New York City, which raised a, a fair amount of money for BAT every year, and both Mike and I were involved with that. Um, that dinner now has, has since been curtailed, but uh, it was a great event. Um, the last one I think we did actually honored Yogi Berra. Hmm. No, it might not have been the last one. We did win, did do one that uh, that uh, honored Yogi. But uh, in any case, BAT is a great organization, and the fact that it was league sponsors that that uh, the commissioner at the time, who was Peter Uberoth, in fact, got behind the uh, the uh, organization and gave it funding and gave it uh, a home uh, was a big deal. Big deal. Jeff, did you have a favorite personality that you ran into in baseball? You talked about Tommy Lasorda before. Well, yeah, look, look, Tommy was the dugout wizard in the baseball bunch. And uh, one of the things that I used to do was go down to spring training every year and shoot the segments for the, bug out, the dugout wizard. And that was always kind of an interesting experience because uh, Tommy would shoot it uh, usually late at night uh, after he had, uh, had had a couple of drinks at dinner. And it was always an interesting uh, situation. But uh, I, I don't know, I, I met a lot of wonderful people. Uh, when I was working for Major League Baseball, uh, both players and front office people as well. I don't know that I can single out anybody. Working with Johnny Bench and Ozzie Smith, both were, was, were great. Um, I enjoyed doing, we did a lot of blooper specials with people like Tug McGraw, who was great. That was great fun and great stories. And, um, you know, it was a wonderful experience for me. Even if I wasn't the world's biggest baseball fan, meeting and talking to and interacting with these people was a, was a great experience. And it's something that, uh, you know, you couldn't pay money for, which was great. Sure. Now let's talk again about documentaries, okay? Uh -huh. Now what makes a good documentary? Let's put one together. Let's simulate, let's walk through something very basic. You know, we have so many interesting sites here in the New York metropolitan area, mm -hmm. so many historical places. So say you wanted to do something on the revolutionary battles that took mm -hmm. place on these grounds right here in yeah. Summit and Milburn and Springfield. You know, how would you go about What would you look to do? Create well, a theme and... Uh, personally, were, were I a documentary filmmaker, 
charged with the task of doing something like that, I would look again for strong stories. And those stories are almost always based on people and personalities and their roles in uh, whatever happens. And I think if you look at even some of the bigger theatrical films that have been done on history, they focus in on personalities. I'm thinking now of, uh, I don't know why, the, the, the theatrical that uh, Paul Giamatti did on uh, John Adams on HBO. But, but uh, focus in on, on a story and a personality and then do your best to tell that story uh, with, you know, role in material uh, uh, and, and um, interviews with people who have an expertise in that area. I mean, that's kind of standard documentary filmmaking, but I still think it's the best way to tell the story as long as it's a good story to tell. And I think that's the key. Find the best story and tell it the best way you can. Good story, well told, makes a good documentary. What other items go into a nice production. Obviously, you know, we just take it for granted sometimes when we watch it, but you hear music in the background. There's a theme. There's some kind yeah. of, whether it's a, a quiet music or a loud music, it, it kind of brings out the emotion, like NFL highlights did for years. Great music. Great music. Uh, uh, NFL. We used to use a lot of NFL music in baseball. Yeah. So, uh, but, um, yeah, no, great music is very important for documentaries and for, for, for films and, and television in general. It, it's important to communicate mood and stuff like that. But, um, again, I think that especially when one is dealing with history, which is one of the things that I luckily was able to do, is that the use of stock footage, research, stills, Something that, in fact, Ken Burns did a very fine job with his uh, with his uh, Civil War documentary. The use of stills, the use of uh, uh, of, of techniques to work around those stills, um, with uh, you know uh, zooming into certain places and stuff. Bringing like that. the stills to life. Bringing the stills to life. I think it, I think that's very important. And those are the, the, the techniques that uh, have become available uh, quite easily to people these days. I mean, you can do stuff now with still images uh, on a computer that we used to do, have to do with fancy moves on an animation stand with plots and moving cameras. Now you just, you know, take a keyframe here, a keyframe there, and you know, the computer does it all for you. Uh, and and uh, I think that's opened up uh, uh, the world of documentary filmmaking to a lot of people who uh, might not have had, av had it available in the past. And you don't have to be really sophisticated. Let's say you're a viewer out there and you want to say, okay, I want to do a little bit of a history of my family. I want to go back a generation mm -hmm. or two and I want to have some of those old black and white stills. You can actually bring them to life on your oh, own. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the beauty of the whole, of the, of the change in technology is that you no longer need the big animation stands and you don't no longer need the fancy editing equipment. You can do this with, uh, you know, a program that you can buy down at the at the local shop, uh, you know, movie studio or uh, iMovie, or there are a bunch of them that that, that are available, and uh, and put together your own documentaries. And I think, again, that's given uh, uh, young people uh, access to the medium that we never had as as kids. Um, you know, my my first film was shot on eight millimeter sound which was the striped eight man was tiny and you couldn't cut it, it was a mess. I think I still have a copy of it actually. <laughs> um, well, and it was that. expensive, not anymore. Jeff, you know, with the explosion of all these stations, sometimes we're overwhelmed watching TV. And of course, watching TV's changed so much. There's a whole generation out there that watches Netflix and they watch just things on demand. But, you know, for stations like ours, mm -hmm. local, Okay, we you know, refer to them as peg stations, access stations. Yep. Where do you see the potential of a station that's local? Well, I still think that, um, and, and, and a lot of people have said, you know, all news is local, all politics is local when it comes down to what people really care about. And I think that that's the future of peg television. It's also the past of peg television. It's why it exists. It's the stories from the local community that you said, gee, that guy's down the street, I didn't know that. It's things that you can bring to life on the channel that wouldn't have a home anyplace else other than in the community. You know, Channel 4 is not gonna be interested in the local uh, uh, winemaking store down the street. But I'm sitting at home in Summit and I know that I can go and, gee, you know, I'd love to make my own wine. And I find out that there's a place I can go to do that. I still think that has tremendous appeal. And I think that that's the reason that peg channels 
exist and will continue to, to exist even in the you know 500 channel environment or if you will the no channel environment which is really what we're heading heading for and what will happen then Jeff when it's a no channel It'll just be I think it's it, it, yeah. It's it's okay. It's nine o'clock. I've got a I've got a few minutes. What can I do with that? Those few minutes. And I think a lot of young people today. That's how they watch television. Um, and there's a, a great deal of material available in what they call over the top now, uh, where uh, you can you know, watch Netflix or you can watch uh, uh, you know. HBO Go on your laptop or on your uh, your iPad, and you can watch it when you want, and you can watch what you want. Um, now, now I think that changes the experience of television. I think that there's less and less of those, um, you know, uh, moments where you gather around the water cooler and say, "Hey, did you see Seinfeld last night?" There's less and less of that, which is kind of sad. Uh, though it's still available to us, it's just not as popular as it once was. Basically, it's live events that still draw the the biggest ratings, well, whether it be sports or sports is is very important to uh, network television and 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 the cable channels that deal with sports very important. But at some point along the way, the sports there, there, there is an economic reality to that too, and rights fees have escalated, and it's very expensive these days to produce sporting events. So again, everything has a, uh, a, a cost, and everything uh, ha has, uh, has to produce eyeballs so that advertisers would be willing to pay the amount of money that they need to pay to do it. Right now, the Super Bowl is still the number one uh, thing every year, and it will continue to be that way for a while. And it will be on broadcast television. I predict it now for a long time, for well, a long time. Well, Jeff, for the young person, I know we referenced them the first, uh, our first show. Are the opportunities still out there in this industry? Oh, I, I think so. Uh, as I say, um, there are many, many more channels now and many, many more websites that create content which become potential employee employers for people interested in this business. Um, unfortunately, there are also many, many more programs that turn out people with communication degrees to work in those areas. But I still think that if you can write, you can think, and you can tell a story, you can work. And I think it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, right place, right time, dedication, and, and, and pounding the pavement to find the, a place to start and to learn your craft and to build a reel. And then when one has a reel that one can look at, one can move on and on and on. Definitely. Who was your biggest influence? Boy, that's a good question. I, ha I had a number of people. Um, on the creative side, it was a guy named Herb Strauss that I worked with at Kenyon and Eckhart, um, who was the executive producer of all of the producers within the television department there. Um, I, I learned how to, to deal with people. Um, and so uh, from, her from Herb, and, 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 and so in terms of, uh, of being a television executive, or a production company executive, I learned how to try and get the best out of people. One of the things that I learned from, from Herb, which I think is a very, very important uh, lesson, is don't be afraid to fail. And don't build an environment, particularly a creative environment, where people are afraid to fail. Because if you're afraid to fail, you never try anything new. Hey, listen, this is a creative world. Some things work, some things don't. But if you don't try, you never know. You have to break and through. You have to be, yeah, exactly. So uh, I think that's one of the things I learned from, from Herb as a, as a mentor. Uh, there was another guy named Dave Reisman who was much more on the technical side. And he taught me to uh, you know, look at what was available out there in terms of tools to uh, 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 execute my craft, as it were, our craft. And um, uh, so I learned a lot from Dave about uh, the film business at that point. And then uh, my, my first professor at, at Brandeis, a guy named David Hardy, who was a pretty well-known uh, documentarian, um, Englishman, crazy Englishman. Um, uh, and uh, it was kind of fun to work with him and learn how to make movies. And that's what I went to film school for. That's why I, I stayed at Brandeis for my MFA, because David was running the department. And then he was killed in a car accident. Oh. 
in my uh, in my second year in, in the summer between my first and second year uh, of graduate school mm -hmm. uh, and he passed away and the, and the program which really was him kind of fizzled after that now moving forward you come down to New Jersey and we went through all that and, yeah but you have three people in your life that have been very supportive to some very strange hours and that's your wife and two daughters that's for sure uh, particularly my wife who had to put up with me being on the road you know, it, it, interestingly enough, I used to tell people who would come to work uh, for us, I said, you know, this is the greatest job in sports television because basically we worked Sunday to Friday and you had Saturday off. And in the latter years, you had Saturday, Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday off like a normal person. Well, in the sports television business, that's unheard of. But this week in baseball's production schedule was such that it had to be done for the weekend. That said, all of our other projects, just about everything else we did involved travel, involved shooting on the weekends, and, and, and involved being away from home. And yes, for that, my wife was tremendously supportive when she was raising our two daughters, and uh, I was gone weekends, and you know, oh dear, I'm not gonna be home for dinner tonight, I have to work late in the uh, edit room, and this, that, and the other thing. Yes. Very important. However, you lived in northern New Jersey you, throughout your career and was close enough to the city. Jeff Bellinfonte, this has been fascinating. I've really enjoyed these this hour with you, and I certainly look forward to catching up with you down the road. Um, in closing, best memory. Best memory. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, the, the best memory I have was working with the people that I got to work with, both on the creative side and the staff that did that. It, it, it isn't a single memory. It's a memory of a, of, a, of a group that came together that's sort of like catching lightning in a bottle, that worked together. We were all young. I was the oldest person in the place. And we were able to work together to do something that people hadn't done before and that other people appreciated. And I think that's my memory, and, and that's why I'd like to leave it. Well, fascinating career, fascinating story, and uh, we thank you so much for joining this hometown special.